more than 150 acting credits according to IMDb. Don't stop. 275 episodes of Star Trek. He's appeared in more episodes of sci-fi sci television than any other actor. Yeah. Woo! Star Trek episodes and movies as the same character than anyone. Yeah. And I haven't got a penny to my name. <laughs> I don't believe that. Don't like that. Okay, so here's the first question. We'll see how big. Who's a big Michael Dorn fan for? Okay. So then you're going to be able to answer what was Michael's first TV credit? That's pretty Anybody? Do you remember what your first TV credit was? Well, that's a good question. Credit. According to IMDb, your first regular, I guess, would be a way of putting it. Your first regular? It had to be one of the chips. But, the, I was uncredited in the first rock. Okay. Now, were you on Days of Our Lives? That was later. Oh, okay. That was later. So, Chip, Days of Our Lives was after Chips. After Chips. Okay. And so, Days of Our Lives and a show called Capital. Lola Falana. Who I had to kiss. <laughs> That's heartbreaking. I think, you know, I think she was a little freaked out by me because I just, I, I think I had a look on my face. <laughs> of like, oh yeah. <laughs> and those of you who are too young to know who Lola Falana is, when this is over, I am DB Lola Falana. Yeah. <laughs> she, she was like, all, all of us were like, same. Uh, well, tell us, let's, let's start with Chips. You were Officer Jebediah Turner. Jebediah. Jebediah, okay, I'm my, my Jed. 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 Oh, Jed. Uh, and, and, and as I recall, having watched the show back then, your job was to roll up on the scene after Punch and John or whoever had done whatever needed to be done, and you were like, take them away, and that was your job. Uh, actually, uh, it was, there were two jobs, uh, correct? Roll up on the scene, and they say, okay, Jed, here. And I had to, come here, you. Drive away. And also, we would be chasing people, and of course, we'd get in a wreck, or a case, and they'd roll up on the motorcycle and say, Hey, Jeff, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Go get them, Punch. <laughs> and that was my other uh, three, three lines. Did you actually arrest anybody on the show? Yes, I did actually. Did. I arrested two people on the show. Nice. But you gotta, you got to know something, though. We, we only drew our guns one time in seven years. Never drew our guns. We were, you know, bad guys. If they were robbed banks or, or ran over people or whatever the case, Eric Estrada would ride up and they'd go, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a gun and a knife, but I give up. It was the teeth. They blinded him, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> just couldn't see. Yeah, his, his handsomeness was just like, oh my God, he's, you're too good looking to kill. <laughs> So how did you get in? How did you become part of Chips? Because Chips had been established for a while when you got on the show, right? Uh, it's a great story. In fact, my whole life is, is filled with these kind of stories, which is, uh, uh, I, I had, when the show first started, the first year, I was working extra in the business. Because I wanted, I wanted to be a director, and it was a way you could make money in the business, see how it works, and then go to directing. And the first year of Chips, they said, well, we're, we'd like you to come in as an extra. Motorcycle cop in the briefing room. So every time in the briefing room, if you look at the first year, you can see them. <laughs> Big hair, mustache, <laughs> thin glasses too. And um, and also they uh, they had us driving up and down the closed off section of the freeways in LA. So they were doing all the chasing. They couldn't do that on live freeways, of course. And so I did that for six months. Uh, and they changed and wanted a different guy, so I didn't come back. And at that point, I said, okay, I'm done with working at you. I'm going to do this business. I want to be a principal. And so I quit the extra work and started uh, doing principal work in one of the jobs or one of the things. Like a year later, I get a call and I say, oh, they want to see you as a cop on chips. And I went, oh, that's nice. I didn't say nothing to me. <laughs> and so I came in audition. The first guy they hired, they said, well, Michael, we, we really liked your reading, but we're going to go with this guy. He happens to give you a role, which means don't call us for all of you. And I kind of went on with my business. And the guy had told them 
that he could ride a motorcycle. And he could not ride a motorcycle. <laughs> he really couldn't ride a motorcycle. And so he, uh, he was fine. They were okay with him. A little accurate, but he uh, was fine. And they said, okay, jump on the motorcycle and ride over there. He said, okay. He jumped on the motorcycle and went right into a brick wall. <laughs> so that's when they called him. And they said, oh, Michael, we'd like to see you again. <laughs> I said, oh, good, am I going to be in a motorcycle? No, you're going to be in a car. <laughs> so that's how I am. I had three years on that show. Uh, Larry and Eric were, were fantastic. The first day I came back to work as an actor, I see Larry and he goes, Michael, what are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, it was a great experience. Why? A wild experience. Because it was the early 80s. And yeah. <laughs> Somebody over there went, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I, I just was in San Antonio with Larry and Eric at a convention, and Larry and I went to dinner that night, and we were just railing against each other with stories, of, which I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> of the 80s and how we are lucky to be here. <laughs> so that's, how, that's why it chips. But it was great. It was, it was two things that I, that I learned from so I'm all about learning, is that um, I learned about the business, I learned that while you're on a show, especially in those days on a network show, I mean, you're at the top of the world, you're at the top of the food chain, and they would, you know, make you get Tiffany presents for your birthday, for Christmas, and they call every week, is everything okay? Is there anything we can do for you? The publicity department, and they'd see the call all the time, my, anything, it was on and on. And when I left the show, they didn't call me back until the last season. That day, it was over. Nobody called. No more presents. Nothing. It was just jarring. And I could see how people got screwed up behind me because you think that you made it. You think that if this is it, I'm a star. I want other things. Not a bit. I also learned that um, you really have to watch think you're going to be making that kind of money forever and it's over. I mean, it's over. And you've got houses and cars and stuff. And luckily I wasn't making that much. I was just a you know, semi-regular. So I, I saw other people with millions of dollars losing all that because they just always going on. So I really carried them with me for the rest of my first time. People have helped me. On next generation, is it my budget going to buy a house? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you live in a single apartment? Yes, and I love it. I'm not going to move. Well, and so, of course, there was the next job. And I think we all know what the next big, big job was. Next so job. tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you auditioned for. Yes. What guidance did they give you when you walked in? What, uh, there was no, there really wasn't any guidance about the character uh, because uh, the story is, and this is the real story, is that I had asked my managers and, and agents, you know, to get me a reading for the, for the show things when I heard it was happening. And they called, they said, we're sorry, Michael, it's already cast. If there's something else, you know, it comes up, we'll give you a call. I just get that. <laughs> we like you, but no, we're going to give you a call. And I said, oh, great, you know, because at that point, I was doing very well. I was working on a lot of different shows, comedies and dramas, and so I was going on with my career. Uh, two weeks later, I get a call saying, we're going to see you for the part of the Klingon. Okay, great. I love Klingons. I was a fan of the original show, so, uh, and, but it was, they didn't give you any direction, but I knew what they wanted. Uh, the lady I was dating at the time was a big fan. In fact, we had a lot of Contest to see if we could stump each other for, with trivia, Star Trek trivia. And she beat me uh, because she says, okay, what are the words to the Star Trek theme? I said, come on, you're like, she goes, no. She sang the words to the Star Trek theme, so she won. And so she got me a, a couple of books that she knew about playing on, so she had, and, and so I studied them and I said, okay, yeah, see what they, what play on are about. I went in there, I was gruff, surly, quiet. Um, I 
walked into the room, um, basically the studio where I was reading, and I went up to the secretary and I said, uh, excuse me, where can I be alone? <laughs> she was uh, over there, so I went into a room by myself, didn't talk to anybody. I knew the people there, didn't talk to anybody. And I walked into the reading, and there was Gene Roddenberry and Bob Justman freaking out inside. <laughs> Outside, I was, I was growing surly and quiet. Hello, <clears throat> how are you doing? Hello. And I did the lines, I said, thank you, and I walked out. And that was it. And I think they kind of went, yeah. <laughs> and so that's how, that's how it happened. So over the course of the show, how much influence did you have on, the, not really the, the character development of Worf, but really on the species of Klingon? I mean, a lot of what you oh. did became you know, canon for the show. Not at all, none. Uh, the, the only thing I did was, I uh, went up to Gene, I think it was maybe the, the first episode, and um, must have been a couple of days in, into my uh, shooting, and I go, what do you want from this character? I mean, what is, you know, I mean, I got no guidance, and he said, just make the character your own. Don't listen to what you, I mean, don't listen to what you've said, what you've seen in the past, this is your people, so I'm making your own. So, that's what I did. And fortunately, the writers took off of there. I think they, they went, oh my God, because he was so opposite of everybody else in the show that they, it was great territory for them. It was like unmined territory because everybody else in the show was just so wonderful and nice and great comrades and out there. And I was pissed at everything. <laughs> That was, that was how I played the character. Every time somebody would talk to me, I would just be so angry. <laughs> but they'd ask me to do anything. Uh, Warwick, would you hand me that pencil? Yes, sir! <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that was, that was, and they, luckily, I never went up to the, to, the, to the writers or the producers or anybody for years. Generation he never said that. All of that was there, and all the mythology uh, was their idea. They hired one of the best things they did. They hired Ron Moore and Brandon Broder as writers, and Ron Moore was the head Klingon writer. And he wrote some beautiful stuff uh, about, the, about the characters and about the uh, mythology. So, and it carried on. So that's great. Right. Why do you think the character resonates so well and so strongly with all the fans? You know, I think you got to ask everybody, and everybody will have a different, uh, different uh, story as to why Star Trek and the character resonated. A lot of people love the. Am I boring you? I don't care. No, this guy right here is just yawning. I don't know. Michael Dornay. Right? You know, I unhinged his ass. I shall get very angry that I will talk certainly to you. Uh, but no, no, it, it was. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> you were talking about being on love. Oh, yeah. Uh, the character was, you know, a lot of people love the honor, uh, the loyalty. I think that that was big. That was really huge with, uh, with a lot of people. A lot of people, uh, it resonated because he was an orphan. He was a guy that really didn't have a, uh, any ties, basically, except from what he's heard to other people. And uh, he, he overcame that. Very difficult, you know, because not because of anything. I think it was well because it was it was a difficult situation. Although uh, the people around him accepted it, uh, it was just difficult because he didn't have a home, and, and you don't have a home culture. I think that resonated too. I think you know if you think about it, uh, if you look at you know African Americans in this country, they don't really have a home basically. Where Americans, but where do they come from? You know, other races, other cultures, they can trace them. It goes back thousands of years and all this type of stuff. And so I think that resonated. Um, and, you know, to overcome these things in a lot of ways. I think a lot of it is just, and also I think a big thing for me was that he's a guy's guy. Yeah. He's just a guy, you know. Yeah. He walks around and he stomps around and doesn't really know much anymore. A man of few words. Whoa! What do you think? Do you think we should go or fight? Do you think what they're going to do? Or what? How about if we went down there and goes, No. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think we ought to do? Yes. <laughs> Wolf, can you elaborate? No. <laughs> I think.
think that was, you know, just, I love that part of my, that was my favorite part. Was, okay, God, God. All right, so we're going to open up to questions in a second, but I'm going to ask one question for yes, you can start queuing up, come on. Uh, but I know we're going to get this question asked, so I'm going to ask it myself. Uh, you once said, I would love to start a television series of my own. I love the idea of living uh, with a character for a number of years, watching it grow, or approximately said that. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the Captain Wharf series. Sure. Where are we with that? Where does that stand? Uh, the Captain Wharf series, for one time, I'll say nothing. At least everyone's going to sit down. <laughs> that was a question. Uh, the Captain Wharf series was a great idea. Uh, it was an idea I had. Uh, People love the script. Uh, it just took too long to get it uh, because I think they, and I'm right now, I don't know that Paramount wanted to do their own TV series. And as you guys know, it's a video that's going to be out in January 2017. So that kind of put the nail in the comment. I don't think they want to have two shows on the air. They could, I guess, but, um, and it's possible. Any, any chance of an elderly dwarf possibly being in the new show? I have no idea, I don't think so. I mean, nobody said it to me yet, but you know, you don't know we're in space for God's sake, so I think it's a nice thing. we like to see an elderly or a young Please need to reach out to, to do the Bejo Tremble thing and reach out to, uh, to Paramount and CBS and say, hey. I, I think, you know, I think, that, I think we don't, you could do that, but I think they, Shows in good hands. I met the producer and I met the, uh, and I knew one of the other uh, guest producer writers on the show. So they're in great hands. And if it's a good idea, they'll do it. But uh, it never hurts to be part of the There you go. And if he likes it, right, it's got to be good, right? So I think. Okay, let's make sure that mic's on. Go ahead and ask a question. Hello. There you go. Go for it. Next generation? Oh, 60s. I'm Anyways, I'm a huge fan of yours. I have James Dupin, I'm 17, and I'm a big highlight. And I didn't know you were a fan of it here, and then my daughter said, oh, by the way, Michael Jordan's going to be in the stuff. I'm here. So, oh. um, but I did want to ask you, one of my favorite episodes in this is called The Union, mm -hmm. KR. Susie Plaxon. Susie Plaxon. I think that was season four. Maybe it's season four. It was really on. Anyway, well. It is one of my most favorite episodes. Of, of yours, and also the ones that you were adopted parents were really on board. You know, prized to visit you and your all parents. Thank you. And in the end, you really showed your soft side of the love for your adopted parents. Oh. And I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you for something that's one of my most favorite episodes. I you know, stay watch Star Trek. Like every day. And you're not alone in every day. No, no, it's like, you know, don't be shy. But, well, me, like, plays it nonstop. Okay. And I can talk to you. But I wanted to ask you what really uh, all of the scenes were the your favorite episode, and how long did it take you to process that song? Uh, my favorite episode was The Trouble, uh, was yeah. followed by. Uh, the offspring for me that was the child. Yeah. I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant episode. Um, and and I didn't I had a little bit to do with the drum head. I mean it wasn't really about the character, but I thought that it was very well written. Great. And I love writing and I love music. shows that have great dialogue and stories and that. And they won the best thing. So those those were my favorite. And it was it started out to be the, the first First year for my prosthetic was three three hours. I had to be there at four thirty in the morning uh, to be ready to shoot my seventh grade. So for the first two years. Thank you. Got it. Three hours. That probably helped you get angry to be more. Well, no, it, it helped. Uh, yeah, it helped a lot. I mean, everybody thought that I was on the show, but they never saw me. Two years, they never saw me really without makeup on the same show. So they just thought I was an angry, surly person. <laughs> uh, so, my question is because you were a fan of Star Trek for the 
fan base? Yeah, like just the scale of it and the passion of it. Like, when did that actually be? Um, it was the last season of our show. Because um, we, had, we had been doing conventions. But the last couple of years of our show, which was 94, 95, 93, 94, uh, we were filling arenas, big, big venues. Um, and, and we were just going, oh, God, this thing is really taking off. We were all shocked at the end, they wanted to end it. That sense is we were going to do a two more season. But, uh, but that's when it kind of hit us. About the fan base, we do the Roman Catholicism, but we still weren't. I, I don't think we we do that was going to continue to now. I, I thought maybe three or four years after the show was over, they'd go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. No chance. <laughs> you won't. Oh sure, yeah. The story. In fact, I was I was actually thinking about releasing it online. I mean, I still may do that. But um, but the story is is not Starfleet. It's about the Klingon Empire and how the Klingon Empire has got to change, and uh, it's changing with great difficulty and with a lot of pains, a lot of growing pains. And so what you see is that you see the same thing that we've seen for many many years, which is a Klingon society and how the rule and assassinations and coups and all that kind of stuff. But also they've had a change, and so we also see a smatter of Starfleet officers running around the Klingon Empire. And other races kind of running around there. And we don't like that at all. But you would have to know. And there is, as usual, there's some intrigue going on with the Klingons and the hierarchy. And Warp reluctantly gets involved in it. But he'd rather be on a ship out there. And so we see a lot of that. We, we take that from the original series. Of, you're on a ship, basically. You're out there and you know, chases and battles and things like that. And he has a, a pretty cool girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and she's she's hot. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is, there was, uh, yes, I did. In fact, I had a producer who was working with him. It was the girl who played the Cylon on, in um, Galactica. It's all about the thing. Trish Yeah, we had it in mind. But, the, you know, because you had to be along with being, you know, like hot. You had to be athletic. And you have to be, you know, as dangerous as, as warriors. And uh, we had some. Like I said, I'll, I think I'm going to do this again and see this. Thank you. Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm a huge fan. Cool. Uh, except two quick questions to our audience. Sure. Uh, first one is I heard you're quite the aviator. Quite the uh, aviator. I've heard rumors talking to other people that you've actually flown like a, a Russian maker before. Yes. <laughs> how, how do you get her? Like, how did that happen? <laughs> well, you, you, you well, <laughs> uh, it's quite it, 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 the Russian thing thing is is kind of a an offshoot of, of my passion for flying. I, I've always been flying. I was a big, still am a big, uh, you know, World War Two flying buff in Korea, and all this stuff. And I got to meet some great pilots and pilots that I. Uh, so that was part of it. But what, what happens is that uh, I, I got into uh, ex-military jets, and I flew a T-33, I owned a T-33 for a while, an F-86, and, uh, and I flew those around like crazy. Came up here a few times for uh, air shows and things. And uh, but one of the things that happened is that I got in trouble with the FAA one one year, and we were I had done something. Didn't mean to, but it was not fun. They uh, they really came down pretty hard on me, so that I had to go with my lawyer, who was also one of my best friends and a pilot. He's also a fantastic lawyer. We had to go to the FAA headquarters down in El Segundo, California, and got grilled by this attorney. I mean, it was. I'm like, so what? 
were you doing that? Why were you doing that? I mean, really, like, and at one point, it just looked like it wasn't going well. And initially, when you do things, what I had done, they'd go, you know, that was bad. Come up to the tower for a day and, and see what we do and see what we have to deal with. And that's your kind of punishment. But because I was a high-profile guy, a high-profile airplane, the F-86, they're going to make an example of me. So, anyway. So, my lawyer goes and writes something on this little slip of paper and passes it to me and it says, we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> and she's a lawyer, she sees that and she can't read it, you know, but she knows that. She says, okay, what we're going to do, we want you as punishment, we want you to get your license or letter of authorization in a similar jet like a MiG-15. <laughs> And we went, really? Okay. <laughs> and both, I learned a lot from my Lord. He's stone faced, I'm stone faced. And we walk outside and went, that's punishment? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I love that. You know? But the cool thing is, so I went up to uh, Reno Stead, where they have the air forces. And they have a, in those days, they had a bunch of things up there. One of the instructors, whose his his family uh, or his couple, uh, John Penny, who used to race for Bray Air uh, up in America, he was the instructor, and he and I became extremely close. And after, and in fact, he told me that that he was going to know great. Here's this actor, and got to you know, he probably screwed up. He's not very good. Uh, so I get up there and he was basically, after we had got my LOA, he says, Michael, I don't understand what the, what the problem was. <laughs> You're a good pilot, you got it, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so that's, that's the big story. But it's really cool, I'm glad they did it. It, it punished me a little bit because it, it was a lot of money to, to, to actually license it and get your license. And that sort of thing. But I met John and he and I are still great friends. So. Uh, well, the second question I had was, you know, with all the reboots of uh, Star Trek going on, um, well, I've been having to talk about, like, the next generation, which we're a big fan of, if it was ever recast, like, who would I'm you... I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I've heard that question before, but no, I, I, my ego just won't let me answer that. <laughs> Fair enough. Who, who would take my place? Uh, <laughs> no one. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome, man. Do you fly now? What, what do you oh, yeah. Notice? Yeah, I have a, a, a citation, single, uh, single pilot, uh, citation jet. And how did you get into becoming a pilot? Where was that just a yeah, I was, I was always, always, always since I was, since I was uh, a child. And um, when I was on ships, I had a chance. I couldn't do it for some reason because Larry Wilcox was a pilot. And so he invited me out to fly one day and I couldn't do it. But, um, uh, but when I got on Next Generation, the first season, or something very frugal, and there was a guy on the show who was a pilot, and he and I would talk flying every day. And he said, Why do you have to do this? So, luckily, the second season there was a strike, and I had five months of nothing to do. And so, I had some extra money, and so I did. Went out there, and the first flight I took, I went, Okay, I'm booked. That's how it happened. Right. Thank you. Hi. Um, Question about the next generation. Yes. Um, that series, Star Trek in general, you know, they have a lot of future tech. They have phasers and they have replicators and all that. And they have the Bailey too. But uh, the what? The Bailey. That one, sorry. And uh, I was just wondering, did did anyone did Roddenberry give you a problem? Like, We're going to use this for this scene. You just go, this is ridiculous. I have to use this for a scene. Like, was there any problem that was just pulling two? Um, not in not in next generation. There was a prop in Deep Space Nine that I had a twenty minute argument <laughs> <laughs> with the producers about, and it was Ferengi to the shark. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
bid on it, you know, and I'm supposed to go, <laughs> you know, and I went, no. <laughs> and it was a 20 minute argument. Which was, and I, I, they hated me after that because I held up production for 20 minutes. Because I just thought it was a ridiculous problem. But the interesting thing was is that uh, what I loved was we had an iPad. And that technology is just amazing. It's amazing. You won't? Go ahead. How did you feel about going to Deep Space Nine? How did I feel about going to Deep Space Nine? Um, pretty good. Uh, because a number of reasons. I was, uh, it was a challenge because they, um, you knew that you were going up there to, you know, kind of help with the ratings because they were concerned about it continuing. And uh, that was a challenge. I mean, to say that, okay, Michael, we're bringing you over, they didn't say that we're bringing you over here to help the show. Because if you helped it, great. You know, it was, it was a wonderful challenge. If you didn't help it, then you just an overpaid jerk actor, you know. So, so that was, that was great. And also, it was a very funny thing that how I, I never thought I'd get in that makeup again after the next story was over. I just thought that was it, just to do the and we're done. But I was surprised at how I how quickly I went, oh okay, no. Does it sound good? It sounded good. Okay. So it wasn't a problem. Thank you. Next question, go ahead. That for you seem with obviously the best. The what? The uh, two sharpers. I'm sorry, I love that. Uh, and a guy named Dan Curry who 
a special type of artist, special effects artist on, uh, on next generation, because he was a martial arts master. And so we designed that with that and all this type of stuff. Plus, so, and so every time that there would be a battle scene or a fight scene, he and I would get together a couple of days before and work out what it would look like, and then we'd take that to the stunt guys, and then they would sort of add their little things that they needed. That's how it happened. But it was. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Um, also, with, uh, I still have the consent that's on, of con conversation. Conversational, yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, did you have any role in developing uh, the language? No, I didn't. No, the language was already there before I got the job, actually. Yeah. And, but I thought it was a very funny take. Yeah. I really liked it a lot. I thought it was, when I, they said, well, Michael, here's the tape, listen to it. Uh, I was just chuckling right. through, through, the, through the thing because it was very funny. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask everybody to ask your questions quickly. Okay. The first question is, I know that was an experience, and you're going to hold it, but was it Speak into the mic. Sorry. Was it a strange transition at first, going from TNG to Deep Space Nine, and when you went to very different shows? No, no. The, the transition was, was extremely easy. It was just a, the difficult part was that they were a very serious show. At our show, we weren't very serious. I mean, we were, you know, of course we looked serious on camera, but, but we were out of control. <laughs> when, when the cameras were off, we weren't pranksters, we didn't pull jokes on people, but we just cracked each other up all the time. And so that was very different because they were very serious. Mr. Dorn, would you like to stand over there? Oh, would you come over there? Yep, I'm right here, just talk to me. <laughs> Very serious over here. So, next question. Yes, I have one other, and that's this is the geeky question. Um, what, who, if any, besides Warfin, is would be your favorite character in Deep Space Nine? On, on Deep Space Nine? Yeah, besides Warfin, obviously. I, you know, I thought that the call of me. Thank you. One of my favorite Morph moments is the moment when Data asks me to watch his 
Yes.
other evidence, but those I got the dress up. But I, I didn't want to describe it. I didn't want to wear it. No, not at all. We can do it. Just stop. And uh, what's the second most favorite Keo uh, Weissel series actor? Oh, uh, yeah. The, um, all of the, well, the, there were two Michael Ansara and uh, John Calligos. Um, they were they were always my favorite, and I was very very fortunate to do episodes two episodes with John Calvin in Space Nine. He was a fabulous actor, and really really. I mean, there's a the ending of his last episode, uh, Once More to the Breach, where he says, I mean, he "Knocks me out," and he says this. You know, you know, when I get to the halls of the, I mean, I can't say that. He was brilliant. I watched that. Sing over because it was so good. And when he gets on the pad and he says, Long live the Empire, I mean, it was just, the ending was just, was Ron Moore. But anyway, uh, he was my absolute favorite. He, he died very soon after that last episode, too, which was sad. But he was a great guy, and I, I loved working with him. Thank you. Thank you. Say, I was a little like you know, kind of go, what kind of turnout is going to be up here to stop me, you know? And I was very, very, very you know, pleasantly surprised. I'm really glad to see it. Uh, also, I want to thank everybody for uh, supporting the show all these years. I mean, there's nothing on television or in our business that has this kind of fan base to it. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm an LA law freak and I loved it, you know, I'm not a, I'm a law and order, you know, I love the original, but. You know, you don't see, you know, conventions where <laughs> people come out in suits and briefcases and have rooms where they sue each other for mock trials. You know, you just don't see this in, uh, in, a, in our business. And I've been in the business for a lot of years and I love television movies for years. And it's, it's an amazing phenomenon. And especially now, um, because 2012 was our 20th anniversary, and the crowds were just as big as they were back in the 90s, and we were totally blown away. And uh, we're happy to come out here. But we uh, really appreciate you guys being um, fans that you are. So give yourselves a hand. It's really good.